Thank you very much, Mark, and thank you all for coming to my talk. It's great to be here at UC Santa Barbara. Um, as Mark mentioned, today I will focus on uh, some of the research that we have done related to high-speed interconnects, specifically chip-to-chip -chip interconnects. Um, in my group, we focus in general on mixed signal circuits and systems for variety of applications. Um, ranging from this kind of uh, systems to biomedical applications, but today I mainly focus on high-speed interconnects. And as you know, uh, computing and uh, communication has been pushed into variety of applications uh, across power, uh, performance, and size spectra. So. On one hand, more law and sim scaling of CMOS technology has allowed us to have high performance computers. And this kind of computers and servers require very large bandwidths. And as we will see in the future, even more. And all the way to um, less heavily computing systems, to uh, wireless and mobile devices that still need chip-to-chip -chip communication circuits, and all the way to new applications and emerging ac applications such as biomedical implants. And they vary a lot in terms of the requirements of uh, bandwidths and power, as well as their form factor, as we will see some examples throughout this talk. Uh, but as we will see, there are also a lot of common things about uh, this kind of um, communication links and high-speed interconnects. So as I mentioned, in the low power, low data rate area, we are interested in biomedical implants. Uh, towards the end of my talk, uh, if I have enough time, I will mention uh, some of the work that we have done related to retinal implants and multi-chip systems for biomedical implants. Uh, but on the other hand, which is uh, even more challenging, is the uh, regime that you need very, very high data rate and relatively high power because of the high data rate. It's still, the energy per bit is uh, required to be very, very low. So. So although we have differences in the requirements, there are similarities uh, for both ends of spectrum in terms of energy efficiency or power efficiency, uh, meaning that how much energy we need to send a bit from one chip to another chip or from one module to another module. The other thing is that a variability either in the environment or variation, process variation are big problems for both kind of systems, and we need to solve those kind of problems. So there are common design principles. Most of the time, almost all the time, we need to use the existing digital technologies that, um, that this kind of high-speed IOs will be integrated in with the rest of the computing and digital systems. And we would like them to scale well. We want to migrate them easily from one technology to another technology. So we prefer more digital design. We would like to have hardware sharing to reduce the area. And we would see that it's very nice to have adaptive hardware or hardware that can do self-healing and so on to combat process variation. 
So today I will specifically talk about some of the work that we have done related to optical chip-to-chip uh, -chip -chip interconnects and then the, how we extended it to signaling over on-chip wires because of some of the similarities. Another very important aspect of high-speed communication is clocking. A large portion of the power consumption is due to the clocking in this kind of systems. And I will also talk about clocking, some of the clocking techniques that we have used for high-speed interconnects. And towards the end, I talk about the chip-to-chip -chip communication for origami biomedical implants if, if I have time. My talk is unfortunately a little bit too long. We'll see how far we can go. So let's just start with high performance computing where we actually need, there is a continuous need to have chip-to-chip -chip communication. And for a long time, we in, increased the performance of high, uh, computers by increasing the clock frequency. But now we have gone to the area that in era of increasing the number of cores and not increasing the clock frequency anymore and basically moving to have more and more cores on a single chip and also having multiple processors to achieve the required data rate. And this new kind of architectures actually require even higher bandwidth chip-to-chip -chip communication in the system. So this is from ITRX that shows that basically how, we, how the total bandwidth, the aggregate bandwidth of IOs for high performance computers need to increase in the future. And this is extremely difficult given the fact that the power consumption of this kind of circuits do not scale well as technology scales. So it's a difficult problem that uh, we still have to solve. And this high-speed communication and interconnects that I'm talking about are at many different levels, starting from chip-to-chip, -chip, uh, even on-chip, when you have multi-core processors, chip-to-chip -chip on a card, uh, on a board, and then uh, from card to card at the cabinet level and all the way to the system level. So we need to solve the communication problem at all these different distances and with different requirements. This is just a simplified cartoon that shows maybe how the system would look like with 3D integration of uh, uh, chips that then we have very short distances, but it's still the communication is needed between these chips and maybe silicon carriers with wires to connect them. And then eventually you need to connect these different boards together, maybe using optical interconnects and so on. So there are many different uh, technologies involved and many different types of interconnect uh, need to be uh, developed. So the problem with signaling over wires, of course, is the bandwidth of conventional wires when you have PCB traces. And the fact that as you uh, increase the data rate, uh, you're dealing with more and more intersymbol interferences caused by the fact that the channel looks like something like this if you look at a very old PCB um, that is used for backplane applications. You see a lot of uh, notches due to the VIOS as well as frequency dependent losses that causes intersymbol interferences. Also, when you have many traces next to each other, you get coupling, crosstalk between these different traces, which causes a lot of noise in the system and reduces the maximum data rate that you can have reliably uh, between the two chips. And therefore, people have used equalization techniques. However, equalization techniques require very high power and area, and at some point it becomes very difficult. That's why people are now very much interested in uh, optical interconnects. So instead of signaling over wires for board-to-board -board communication or even chip-to-chip -chip communication, the goal is to use optics, and the, the motivation is the low loss and high bandwidth that optics provides and the possibility of performing WDM to get very high data rates, 
because as you remember in that graph, the number of pins for electrical links does not scale anymore. And a WDM is a very nice solution. And basically, high propagation speed to reduce the latency. But photonics and optical interconnects is only suitable and promising if we actually can achieve very low power consumption. So still, we need ultra low power electronics to be able to achieve that. And at the same time, we need advances at the photonics domain to, to have low cost and efficient photonics that can effectively convert electrical to optical and vice versa. But this is an exciting time for optical interconnects, in fact, because of the advances in silicon photonics. And the fact that uh, it's promises that can bring these optical devices very close or almost integrated, or in the future, very near future, integrated with the electronics. And therefore, it will reduce the parasitics, and it will reduce, um, it, it enhances the energy efficiency of the system. These are some of the examples, not necessarily the best right now, but ring resonators and silicon germanium photodetectors and so on. Many silicon photonic devices have been developed by many different groups, and of course here at UC Santa Barbara, that, um, that paves the way to building very efficient optical interconnects. But it's still, remember that we need to build electronics that interface with this kind of devices. We need CMOS receivers. We need CMOS pixel drivers or modulator drivers at the transmitter side. And still, we need clocking circuits. And remember that clocking is still one of the most challenging part of the system design that needs to be answered. So in my group, we are uh, working on all of this kind of circuits, receiver circuits, as well as recently Vixel drivers, and in the past modulator drivers, as well as clocking circuits. And today I will try to briefly talk about each of them. So let's just start with the optical receiver circuitry that needs to base, uh, receive the optical data through a photodetector you will have an optical current, optically generated current, and the goal is to sense that current and uh, figure out whether we have received a one or zero. A very simple way to do that is, of course, to get this photodetector, to get this current, send it to a resistor to generate the delta V here, and then amplify it and eventually resolve whether you have a one or a zero. But of course, there is this problem with this circuit that there is a direct dependency between the data rate, which is limited by this RC time constant, and this delta V that you get, which is proportional to R times IOP. So there is a direct relationship that are opposing each other and makes this circuit not easy to use. That's why, for a very long time, people have been using trans impedance amplifier, which uses a feedback a resistor across this relatively large gain stage that has a large gain bandwidth product to convert this optical signal to a voltage and resolve it. And as you can see here, the, the dependency of bandwidth and this RC has been broken by having this gain. Uh, element here. But of course, this means that you need an analog circuit here, this trans impedance amplifier, with a relatively large DC current to achieve a high gain bandwidth product for your amplifier to support high data rate and provide enough sensitivity. But moving, and if you want to really bring optics into chip-to-chip -chip communication, first of all, you need to reduce the power consumption significantly. And our goal is to make it mostly, mostly digital circuit rather than a highly analog circuit, because that's what it can migrate much easier, and it can scale much better. So one way to look at it is maybe to just remove the resistor, and integrate this current into a capacitor. 
But as you can imagine, this capacitor, you need to discharge it every time. So one approach is that to charge it for half a cycle and then reset it and then again do it for the next bit, which is similar to a RZ signaling. So this has a couple of problems. First of all, that you are compromising the bandwidth. Second is that the time that you are integrating the optical input is half of the time. So your delta V is reduced. So we want to avoid that. We want to remove this. So if you just have simply the circuit that you integrate the optically generated current into this capacitor, if you look at this voltage, this voltage starts ramping up over time as you receive ones and zeros. So even for a zero, you get a positive current dumped into this cap. So you can basically subtract a current that is equal to the average current of when you receive a one and a zero from this node and get a voltage like this at this input. Now it's a voltage that is increasing when you receive a one and it's decreasing when you receive a zero. So the idea here is to take two samples at the end, uh, basically a sample, one sample per bit time at the end of each bit time. So here we take one sample and here we take another sample and then we compare these two samples and basically resolve the bit. So the idea here is that by taking samples at the end of each bit period and comparing with the previous sample, you can figure out whether you have received a one or a zero. So here we have received a one because this sample is larger. Here you have received a zero because this sample is smaller. So this works actually well. This, um, this, is a, this is actually not a very accurate. So you have two sample and holds, and then you have one comparator that compares these two samples to resolve the data whether we have received a one or a zero. And this current can be easily generated by looking at the average voltage of this node. So if I get a DC balanced input, so over maybe 20 bits, I have DC balanced, meaning the equal number of ones and zeros, the average voltage here will not change. It stays constant. So I can use that, that fact by using a low pass filter here to set this current. So the current required here, the DC current, can be set automatically using a low pass filter. So the advantage of this, remember this feedback is very, very low power, less than microamp, at the level of microamp, um, and very easy to build because it just looks at this average voltage here and sets this DC current to the average of the optically generated current. And the rest is just sample and hold circuits and the digital sense amplifier that compares to the two values. So from here is highly digital. So, so this, is, this is nice about this that employs mainly digital blocks. They, it doesn't have, it doesn't need any high gain stage that operates at the data rate. And basically inherently it generates the differential signal immediately at the front end. Another nice thing about this is that you can use multiple sample and holds here in, in parallel and perform time domain demultiplexing to reduce the speed requirement of the comparators that are needed in the, in the next stage. But the problem here is that this requires a DC balanced input. If you get a very long sequence of ones or zeros in a row, the receiver will not work anymore. And therefore, it needs encoding and decoding. So you need to send coded data like 8B, 10B uh, coded signal to make sure that the signal, the data rate is balanced. So this is the work that has been, I did previously at Stanford. And then my student was looking at this and tried to kind of combat this problem and find out how we can actually build a receiver that can tolerate any type of data, very long sequence of ones and zeros, and still avoid a trans impedance amplifier that is, uh, has a very large DC current. So let's revisit the RC front end. As you can see, the problem previously was that this RC 
should be equal or around your bit time. So therefore, it limits the data rate of your system if you want enough gain, enough resistance here. But how about if we choose this RC to be much larger than our bit time? So let's assume it's 20, 10, or 20 times larger than your bit time. So let's see what happens at this voltage if I receive many ones in a row. So you're receiving a lot of ones at the same time. So what happens is that you get an exponential signal like this, and eventually it flats out. So if you want to do the same type of double sampling, take the two samples and compare them to resolve the information, um, you can look at this signal, this waveform, and start taking samples like this Vn and Vn minus 1. But as you can see, the problem is that you are OK here. Basically, you get good signals here. Because you get enough delta V here. But the delta V starts reducing as you receive more ones and ones. And towards the end, actually, you receive no delta V. And that's a problem. You cannot resolve the, the delta V, whether you have a 1 or 0 anymore, as you receive more and more 1s. So how can we solve this problem? The way that we solve this problem is actually by introducing an intentional offset into our, our comparator. So the, the way that we do it is that as this voltage swings, this V voltage here, as this voltage increases, we introduce more and more offsets into our comparators. So as the comparators have more offset, then the offset helps the delta V that we have to resolve it correctly. So if I have an offset that helps this second sample here, as I get one more one, it helps me. But if I get an, another zero, it's going to hurt me. But the, the nice thing is that I will get a very, very strong zero here. So if I get a strong zero, although the offset is going to hurt me, still it, I'm able to resolve the data whether I have a 1 or a 0. So eventually, so what the offset, we call it dynamic offset modulation, does is that overall it provides a constant delta V, effective delta V for our system. So if you look at this, effectively you have all the ones here. You get the delta V over 2. And here, you get a minus delta V over 2 here, um, as it's shown. So you can look at this in, you can look at the equivalent circuit or system in Z domain and explain why this is happening. So effectively, this is the double sampling. We take one sample, we delay another sample, and we take the difference to find whether we have a 1 or 0. And then with dynamic offset modulation, we take a, a proportional, um, we take a, a look at this voltage here, multiply it by a factor of beta, and then subtract it from the delta V that we have, and we, we get a new delta V. So if you write the equation for this system, you will find out that if you choose beta correctly, then you get a constant delta V that is independent of the incoming data pattern. So basically, if beta is equal to this value, which depends on the bit time, and the RC of the front end, you get a constant delta V regardless of whether you receive a 1 or a 0. And therefore, this gives you um, a, a constant value for your comparators. So this is how you, you would build it. You have pass transistors at sample and hold. And then we actually have one buffer here, which is this is, a, this is in fact one analog building block in our uh, design, which has very low gain. And it's mainly to avoid the kickback from the sense amplifier back to our sampler. Still, it has very, very low power consumption, uh, much lower than a TIA if you had a TIA, and it goes to a digital sense amplifier. So what happens here is that we are removing the feedback, 
but we are, what we are doing instead is that we are using a digital sense amplifier that is calibrated. Its offset is digitally calibrated. So the idea is here is to remove analog feedback. Feedback brings a lot of advantages, but the, at the same time increases the power consumption of the system. So we are kind of running things open loop, but we are correcting for offset and we are trying to uh, do that in digital domain by having, I'm not showing all the circuits here uh, because I'm not sure if everyone is in circuit design here, but we have digital bits that correct the offset of that sense amplifier to achieve high sensitivity. And in fact, we, we do the noise analysis for this system. We are limited by the KT over C noise of our sample and hold, as well as the noise of this amplifier and sense amplifier. And there are some trade-offs going on with charge sharing between these capacitors and this, as well as KT over C noise, that we can find the optimum value for these capacitors to achieve the highest possible sensitivity for our receiver. So the only thing that we need to do, that's a good question. There is no error propagation in the operation of the system. So eventually you need to find this beta. So that, if you find that beta, there is no error propagation. But if... Yes, right. No, no, you just immediately compare. If it's a large, if it's a one, you get a one. One of the samples would be higher. Otherwise, it's a zero. So you compare the two samples, and it gives you zero or one. The, the pass analog voltage. So that's OK. That gives us the level here. So as this voltage increases, the offset of sense amp increases. So for changing the offset, we actually use the actual analog voltage to change the offset. We are not making any decision for that. And that's why it's so fast. So you don't need actually any speed in that pass and keeps it low power. So we built this chip in uh, 65 nanometer CMOS and uh, basically uh, we tested it both using an uh, electrical uh, emulator on chip to emulate a photo detector and inject current to the input node and some uh, extra capacitors to mimic our photo detector. And we also tested it using optical uh, measurements. So this shows some of our measurements up to 20 gigabit per second. Uh, for, uh, for electrical measurements, showing the optical, received optical current uh, versus our error rate. So we, get up, we can get as low as 10 to minus 12 at this. This is our measurement um, um, limitations. And then this is also interesting. So this shows how the energy efficiency of our system um, no, I'm sorry, this is, the, this is the sensitivity. This is how, this shows how sensitivity changes as we increase the data rate. So the reason that we have this is mainly because we are wire bonding things and so something is happening here. But as you can see, the, the voltage sensitivity is almost constant up to 20 gigabit per second. And the current, because it's integrating front and increases as we increase the data rate, which is expected. So this is, but the more interesting part is the power uh, efficiency of this circuit. We are interested in picojoule per bit or milliwatt per gigabit per second, where at the best we, we get less than 0.4 milliwatt, milliwatt per gigabit per second, which is 0.4 picojoule per bit of energy, which is one of the most energy efficient designs that has been published in this kind of technology. We also tested it using um, photodiodes wire bonded to our device. 
So uh, as you can imagine, we would get much better performance if we could 3D integrate or if we could have uh, uh, better photodiodes. The reason that our sensitivity is to some degree degraded is because this we can see parasitic of our photodetector is relatively large. So this, this shows the sensitivity measurement when we use optical signals. But we are much more interested to build this kind of receivers for the new silicon photonic devices that promise to have very, very low uh, optical capacitance, um, parasitic capacitances. And the integrating front end, similar to TIA, would benefit significantly in terms of sensitivity as this capacitance is reduced. And the new silicon photonic devices can have been shown to have less than uh, 20 femtofarad of uh, parasitic capacitances, which means that our sensitivity is going to be to improve as we decrease this uh, uh, optical uh, capacitance. So keep in mind that we, we have some level of charge sharing going on as we get lo to lower and lower capacitances. And also we can achieve better and better data rates, but at some point we will be limited by our technology as we decrease the photodiode capacitance. So there are a lot of potentials as we move on with silicon photonics to achieve extremely low power and very high data rate uh, receivers. Uh, so we have built actually a new version of this uh, receiver. It's in fabrication that we have removed uh, the buffer stage with the, with the DC current from our design. And also we have come up with new techniques to basically reduce the charge sharing that is going on between the photodiode cap and our sampling cap, which uh, hopefully we will test in the future. But, um, but an interesting aspect of this design is that we had an RC front end and we tried to kind of do as some sort of equalization. Instead of performing decision feedback equalization, we are doing something that is similar to a feed forward equalization. And we noticed that this has actually a lot of potential for perhaps on-chip signaling. Then the reason is that on-chip wires are heavily RC limited. So if you look at uh, wires for long, like for instance, in a multi-core processor, when we look at wires, long wires, um, the main problem here is that these wires have this kind of cross section that they are very tall and narrow, and the resistance of the wire, incre like at least the lower level wires, the resistance is increasing rapidly uh, as technology scales. And overall, this RC behavior of long wires is a big problem in terms of power consumption as, as well as latency. If you look at a wire with the length of L, the delay across the wire when you drive it just with uh, an inverter as it's done in current uh, microprocessors, the delay is scales proportional to L squared. So if you just have an inverter here and an inverter here, you will get penalized as you increase the length of your wire. But what happens if you add repeaters is that you can optimally place repeaters in your long wire, and therefore you can show that when it's optimal, the delay scales proportional to L. Now you have breaking it down by adding these repeaters to your system. So, so it, this shows how things change. This is again from ITRS roadmap that how delay changes over years, delay of long wires. Uh, this is nanosecond per millimeter with repeaters and without repeaters. So we get a big benefit by adding repeaters, but repeaters also mean that you need to, like if you are crossing, these are high le higher level wires, in a multi-core processors, if you are crossing from one side of the chip to other side, you, it means real estate. You have to place, find places to, to, to allocate for these repeaters. And the number of repeaters also increase 
uh, of, as you scale the technology and you scale your chips. So these are again the, the graphs that my student created by using the ITRS roadmap graphs. This shows the, the critical lengths, the distance between the repeaters required as the MOS technology scales. So this is, the, as you see, the distance decreases. This is in micron. As, and also the number of repeaters that you require per millimeter as you, as you uh, scale the CMOS technology. And the power associated with these repeaters also increases rapidly as you scale the technology. So this is a big problem. And overall, this is a little bit old data, but the trend um, states that a lot of the power of the chip is allocated to this kind of interconnects, including for data, for the signal distribution, as well as clock distribution. So this is a big problem. The on-chip communication has um, almost half of the power consumption together with the clocking uh, for, for big microprocessor chips. And as you can imagine, it's a big win if we can really reduce the power consumption of this kind of system. So if you look at the long wire, if you want to avoid repeaters, how about, so the way that it's done right now is that you, they do full swing signaling. So they go all the way from zero to VDD, and they drive all these repeaters so that the wire has a full swing across it. Um, and therefore, uh, what you get if you remove those repeaters is that you have a very heavy RC circuit, a distributed RC, that if you send a pulse across that, you will get a very long tail. So imagine if you want to do the standard DFE, decision feedback equalization, it means you need to many, many number of taps, which means a large power consumption, which is not really practical for on-chip signaling. So remember, we want to remove the repeaters, and instead of doing full swing signaling, we want to do low swing signaling. So if you look at a distributed RC, you can model a wire, you can, be, you can model it as a distributed RC, as you can see. And Elmore, a long time ago, showed that this kind of RC tree, you can model it with a system that has a single pole, a dominant pole. Basically, it, it shows that if you look at the response of this, you can find a dominant pole that has a very similar response to this um, system that has many poles. So this is actually very similar to the optical front end that we have, which has a single pole RC, and therefore it has a behavior like this. So we notice that actually our optical receiver can be applied to this kind of environment as well, because this, this, is, this would look like a system with a dominant pole. So the idea again is here, is to drive your wire, uh, although the time constant of this dominant pole is very large, you can still drive it very fast with a bit time that is much, much smaller than the time constant of your wire, but apply that double sampling dynamic offset modulation technique, the very similar technique that we described to do that. So we actually, that's what we did. We had two sampling holes and again, beta, that is mimics our offset cancellation. And we basically used four of them in, um, in parallel to do the demultiplexing. So each of them is run at one fourth of the data rate. Therefore, we need a clock signal that is a quarter rate. And basically, we designed this for on-chip wires to show that the system worked. At the transmitter side, we have also very simple design. So we just use inverters. So these inverters here drive this wire. We use this capacitive coupling here. This capacitor helps us in different ways. It helps us 
because it provides some level of peaking. Also, it actually drives this wire with a voltage swing that is much smaller than VDD. So you can use VDD here and at the end here because this is a capacitive divider. The output voltage is going to be less than VDD. So you are effectively driving this wire with low swing. And at the same time, the swing for each bit is at the level of less than 20 millivolt. But at the receiver, you need to take two samples. You need sample and hold, and you need precise comparators. So that's where we are paying by having, by trying to uh, resolve delta waves that are very small, but driving our voltage, uh, our wire with low voltage swing to save power consumption. So this actually shows how um, our exponential approximation matches very well with the actual pulse. If we send a 20 gigabit per second pulse, you get a response like this from this circuit. And this is how we approximate it exponentially. Again, our system needs to train to find that beta for optimum um, operation. So we tested, we built this receiver, transceiver, basically both transmitter and receiver for different uh, lengths of wires from five millimeter to seven millimeter as well as a four millimeter. We, what we do, our goal here is that to get very high bandwidth density is to have minimum width wires that are packed next to each other with one layer of shielding a ground between each. So let me show this. So these are minimum width wires with minimum pitch. We don't, the nice thing about this approach is that we don't do differential signaling uh, because our circuit actually provides immediately a differential signal after our single ended input. But we have ground shielding uh, for each. So it's still, this is one of, we achieve by uh, a factor of three to four higher bandwidth density compared to previous repeater less designs because of the fact that we are equalizing this line effectively. And we are allowing our line to be heavily RC, but then later we equalize it. So our, our lines are highly resistive and lossy, and we have shielding to reduce the crosstalk. So this this link here, actually, we have test channels next to each other, two of them to test the crosstalk. So we put two lines next to each other to test that the crosstalk doesn't hurt us because we are doing single-ended signaling. So these are all millimeter. I'm sorry, this should be millimeter. So this shows the data rates that we achieve and the power consumption. Um, the energy efficiency, as you can see, is extremely good for different uh, wire sizes. Uh, all of them, uh, the best that has been reported so far. This is actually uh, how we, it compares, for instance, for a repeater-based system. So if you design a repeater-based system that has about the same performance, of 20 gigabit per second, and with the same bandwidth density of 12.5 gigabit per second per micrometer, you can see that our power consumption is much, much lower, and the latency also has been reduced significantly. So we definitely improve a lot compared to, uh, to repeaters as well as other attempts to build repeaterless links uh, in, uh, in other technologies by other groups. So I'm going to go a little bit faster in the interest of time, but if there is any question, please. The, the differential signal, the, some of these designs are actually diff uses differential signaling. So, um, differential signaling, again, they have some challenges. There have been some work uh, done by Sun Microsystem, now part of Oracle. They need to crisscross them to make it um, 
sim so if you have a bus uh, to make sure that it's truly differential, every now and then you have to cross them. And that actually adds a problem because you need vias to go down to another layer of wire and come up and so on. And you have to do it in a smart way to uh, basically get the truly differential behavior. So uh, the differential, here we chose single-ended because it, we don't require to do that anymore. And instead of using an extra line of differential, we are using um, shielding. Also, at the transmitter side, when you do differential, you need to, you may end up spending more power consumption. But most of these other approaches that are listed here, they use differential signaling uh, because of the same uh, reasons. So as I mentioned before, um, Another important part of high-speed interconnects is clocking. Uh, and a large portion of power consumption actually is spent in clocking to launch the data and at the receiver side to sample the data. And that puts a lot of stress in terms of power consumption. And sometimes 50% of the power consumption is gone into clocking for, uh, for high-speed interconnects. So for parallel links, which are the focus of a lot of work nowadays, it actually makes sense that instead of building a complete clock and data recovery circuit at the receiver side, to send, to have, because we already have many lines, many channels, to send the clock in parallel along with the set of data from the transmitter to receiver. So because we have so many pins already for data, you're going to send one more. Or if you are doing a WDM, you, you allocate one of the wavelengths for the clock. And all you need to do at the receiver side is to disk you because there are process variation and there are length variation between these pins. But at each receiver, you need to try and align this clock with your data in order to sample right in the middle of the data to recover the information. So, so this makes it easier, but at the same time, you still need to regenerate clock for each receiver uh, when you are running at the extreme data rate. So in particular, we are interested in clocking for our uh, WDM receiver in optical interconnect work. This is the chip that I mentioned that has been recently sent with, with the improved uh, uh, receiver design. And our, our goal is to have four like this is, has been already sent for fabrication. There are four lines of data for WDM and one extra line for clock. So we want to receive this clock and then distribute this clock and align it to all the other four. So this is a collaboration between us and Leti and ST. So Leti uh, in Europe is building the silicon photonic chips that will be bonded 3D integrated to our um, IC, to our electronic IC using copper pillars. And these copper pillars are, have very small resistance and capacitances. So one of the promising approaches for clocking of this kind of circuits is to use injection locking. The reason for that is that injection locking are, have very simple uh, implementation and they have very fast locking characteristics. And we are not dealing, uh, compared to a PLL, we are not dealing with the stability issues. And also, they, for this kind of forwarded clock application, when you send the clock along with the data, you want your actually internal generated clock to follow the incoming clock have some jitter tracking, because you are hoping that your data and clock will have the same jitter. So you would like to actually have a wide jitter tracking bandwidth, and also it has very low power. The principle is that if you have an oscillator that has a center frequency, a natural frequency oscillation of omega naught, and then you inject it with a signal that has omega injection, then you injection lock this oscillator, 
you will get an output clock that is also at omega, omega injection if this omega naught and omega injection are close enough. So, but there are some uh, shortcomings with injection lock, uh, L, uh, uh, this kind of injection lock system, and that's because uh, that's mainly because um, they have very let me see yeah they have poor lo poor locking range basically because the injection uh, signal cannot have uh, cannot be very far from the natural frequency of your oscillator and this graph basically shows that especially if you the Q of your LC oscillator is low then your locking range is going to be, um, actually, if the Q is high, the locking range will be very low. On the other hand, in most systems, we would like to have a high Q uh, oscillator because it will have lower power consumption and better jitter performance. So this graph basically shows the locking range versus power of an injection lock oscillator. So this is bad. But in a lot of chip-to-chip -chip applications that uh, we described here, when you want to basically have an optical clock along with your data, a lot of times you need this data rate to be variable because of process and voltage variations and because of different standards. Sometimes you want to reduce the data rate of the system when you are operating at low performance regime. And then sometimes you want to boost the data rate. So it's very important that to get a long, large locking range, so which is a characteristic of a PLL. So our design goal was to combine this uh, PL, a kind of PLL behavior with the, with the injection locking, but keep the simplicity of our uh, injection lock system and all the good behavior in terms of jitter tracking but increase the effective locking range. So this is a work that my student recently did, was published at RFIC 2013. So the idea here is that to have a system that still doesn't have a loop filter like a PLL, therefore it's very fast, it can have injection locking very quickly, but at the same time, it can generate a DC voltage that can uh, bring the natural frequency of RC oscillator close to um, injection frequency so that it can lock and bring it into the locking range. So basically to do that, you need both high, a high frequency component to inject to your oscillator. Also you need a DC component that is automatically generated without using a loop filter. So the idea here is actually to use this mixer here. So you get the input frequency at omega injection, and then you basically, what you do is that you inject a high frequency component and the DC component of uh, generated off of this mixer into your LC oscillator. And we will see that it will, the DC component will bring the natural frequency close to the lock and the high frequency causes it to injection lock. So in the interest of time, I'm not going through all the details, but what we do is basically we inject effectively, effectively two times at the lock, two times of frequency, natural frequency, in the middle node of this LC oscillator. And at the same time, we also provide a DC component off of our mixer uh, to this uh, varactors here to bring the natural frequency of our, our LC oscillator closer to the injection um, frequency and therefore make it lock. So there are a lot of math behind it that shows how this works, uh, but this shows the circuit level block diagram that this is the input frequency that injects, goes to a mixer, the output of this also goes to the mixer. They get mixed together. Because this is at F and this is at F close to that, we almost have two times F at lock. We exactly have two times F plus a DC value. So the DC value will bring the varactors to the range that the 
the frequency will become exactly f. And then the 2f version also injects to this common mode that when the common mode is injected to be 2f, effectively we inject f here and we inject f here. And therefore, we get an injection log system. So we can use two of them and lock them together to generate quarter rate clocks for quarter rate architectures. Again, I'm not going through all the details because uh, my talk is getting too long. But the idea here is to use injection locking and use this kind of this, uh, tricks to enhance the bandwidth of this, uh, the locking range of the injection lock system. This graph shows that it has very wide, it is very fast, it, very, it has a very wide bandwidth, much larger than typical PLO. This has been built in 65 nanometer ball CMOS and has been incorporated in this design as well, which has our four optical WDM optical inputs and uh, injected optical clock. So the way that it works is that the optical, one of, one of the lines is allocated to the clock, it gets injected, and then it gets distributed, and then it, it gets injected again to a local oscillator for each. And it's extremely low power uh, for this kind of applications. So this shows the performance of this device compared to the previous. We have more than two times increase in the injection locking by using this trick. With, be, with using a high quality factor LC oscillator and therefore lower power consumption. So basically this wraps up some of the work that I just wanted to give you some idea of the works in terms of optical clock receivers. We also have recently worked on a big cell drivers. There is another chip in fabrication to use equalization techniques to enhance the performance of pixels using nonlinear equalization and the clocking. So basically, as I mentioned, that these are the three most important building blocks of achieving uh, a complete link, uh, optical link. And our goal has been to reduce the power as much as possible. As I mentioned, this kind of uh, chip to chip communication have many applications at the extremes of this kind of high performance, high speed systems. So as you can imagine, this is um, going up to uh, 50, like if it's um, going up to 15 gigabit per second, which can support a receiver of more than 30 gigabit per second if it's used as a, as a um, um, quarter rate architecture or uh, so on, so you can basically use this kind of clocking system to uh, run more than 30 gigabit per second of data rate. But on the other hand, of, we also have applications that we need much lower data rates, but also much lower overall power consumption. I don't have much time to talk about our biomedical implant work, but that's another place that we have used chip-to-chip uh, -chip communication. Um, in particular for retinal implants. This is a type of implant that uh, is used for people who have lost the photoreceptors in their retina, but they have uh, ganglion cells that are intact. So our system um, uses an external camera that captures the image, sends the data wirelessly to a very small chip inside the eye. The chip also receives wirelessly power from external uh, coils and basically receives the data, does power management and data management and some signal processing and then drives this electrode array that sits on top of the retina to uh, stimulate the, the neurons uh, directly. So this is one of the most difficult type of biomedical implants in terms of the fact that it needs to be very small to fit inside the eye. It needs to be very low power because the link for providing power to it is extremely lossy and inefficient. So power consumption is a big problem and many groups have been working on this. There is already one that got FDA approval by our team 
but it has only 60 electrodes. So our goal has been to try and increase the number of electrodes to, so that the patient can recognize faces and possibly read text. So we need more than 1,000 electrodes. And recently, we built a chip in 65 nanometer CMOS. It was presented at ISSC 2013 with data telemetry, power telemetry, and we basically packaged it with cores and electrode arrays and have tested so far in the vet tested in the lab and the new version will be tested in animals. But as you can see, it is still has a dimension of three by 4.5. And if we want to scale it, the chip is too big. So it has many components in it, digital and analog and power telemetry, clock and data recovery and so on. So, so it's very hard to scale this to increase and enhance the resolution of the retinal implants. So our idea here has been to, instead of using one big chip, use many smaller chips and basically put them on a foldable uh, substrate. And the idea is to fold it origami style through a very small incision, put it inside the eye, because with the eye we cannot have large incision because we cannot stitch the eye. And then inside, deploy it and open it up so that it takes the shape of the eye. And the chips will be inside the folds and need to, as you can imagine, need to communicate with each other. But the nice thing about this is that a, by breaking it down to much, a small, much higher number of chips, you also get robustness and redundancy in your system. Many of these chips would be the same, some of them would be different. So we have been working with origami artists and mathematicians to model this and come up with patterns for us that we can put, uh, we can uh, fold things and put it inside the eye. So this is for instance one pattern that you start with a flat sheet and then after you fold it, we end up with a curved sheet. So the only thing that relates right now to what, I was been, what I've been talking about is the communication between these chips. Because some of these chips can communicate through wires if they are next to each other, but if they are, if they are sharp folds, they need to communicate wirelessly. So we call it the capacitively coupled or proximity communication. So the chips are facing each other and they need to communicate. So this is another regime that the chips are very close to each other, but the power consumption needs, and the data rates are low, but the power consumption needs to be very, very small. So, so there are a lot of details regarding the recon, because you cannot tell that these chips are aligned. We are basically having arrays of pads on each chip that can sense alignment that reconfigure each cell to maximize the communication. So the same pads that are used for alignment sensing are used for communication and basically the chips communicate. So I'm going to skip all this, just show you some one of the chips that have been recently built. And um, so there are these arrays of paths on the surface of each chip that allows us to sense alignment and communicate. And we basically showed that with some perlin in between the chips, we can do the proximity communication. So what I want to show you is the power levels are now at the level of microwatt, and the data rates, instead of like tens of gigabit per seconds, they're tens of megabit per second. But the energy efficiency, as you can see, is about the, the same range, that you get about less than half a picojoule per bit. So in this case, it's less than 0.2 picojoule per bit. So in conclusion, um, as I mentioned before, there are many different applications, and it, they are have different performance and power requirements, and there are a lot of challenges in terms of losses and process variations and power consumption uh, at both ends of high performance and low performance, uh, low data rate regimes. But what is important is that 
in most cases, we, we need to heavily rely on digital control and processing as much as possible to make it more suitable with the current CMOS technology. We need to use mostly digital designs and use circuits that can be adaptive and basically have multifunction. This is the part that I couldn't talk about, like all these sensing and communication circuits are all shared. So the same type of circuits in our biomedical uh, implant chip that is used for sensing is used also for communication, and that's very important to save in area and also power consumption. So I stop here, and I would be happy to answer your questions, and I'm sorry if I went over time. Yes? Your dam approach is very uh, interesting and, and, and helpful. A more mundane approach would just be assuming staff can work together. Could you help us with that? Um, so, yeah, the, there is this rigidity that you get. So, so one, so I couldn't, uh, I didn't have time to talk about this. So one of the biggest challenges with this kind of implants when you have electrodes is to match the tissue and do not actually uh, damage the tissue, but it needs to get very close to tissue. Otherwise, the stimulation will not happen. So there is this important balance that how much pressure you can have. And the reason that we are going to origami is actually the origami helps us to have these folds. And we can't, so if you want to make it perfect, you have to build it for each person, measure the exact curvature of the eye and build it. But we don't, it, that's why actually the device can be very, very expensive. Right now the device with 60 electrodes is more than $150,000. So the idea for us is to have like maybe three versions, small, medium, and large for different eyeball sizes. And this origami, the folds actually, the, that is part of the simulations and the mathematics of it too. Basically, they can move a little bit. The, the folds can open and close relative, relatively less or more for different patients. So it gives us a little bit of flexibility. That's why the, the, the relative distances between the chips, there, there should be some level of movement allowed in the, in the approach. So that's why we think it's the best if, if the chips be able to adapt to each other and based on the alignment, communicate with each other. Yes? Right. Yes, yes. We hold one sample for one bit period, then we compare the next one. Yes, yes. yes. We are not truly differential. This is a very good question. That's why we still need shielding. So the way that we do it, it doesn't provide immunity with very high frequency noise. Right. Yes. Actually, it's, it's for some, it depends on the length of our wire. For some, we, we size that capacitance, the, the coupling capacitance difference, differently, so effectively we go to a different maximum voltage. Right. So I think the problem is that our technique doesn't take care of high frequency noise. So if you put the two, if you bring high, uh, the differential signals, but don't do the crisscrossing, 
the high frequency noise of adjacent signals are going to affect you. So, so therefore, actually, single-ended is much more uh, desired if you are not, if you don't have any problem with noise because it's lower power consumption. So that's why we decided to do single-ended but do the shielding because of the fact that our receiver takes care of the lower frequency noise in the system. Yes, this is for the case that you are, you are, that's actually the question that um, when my student created that graph, I, like, I told him that the higher level nowadays, they don't scale it. That, yes, this graph is for the case of one level below where you scale the, the cross section. So if you continue scaling the cross section, that's what you get. That's a valid question. So if you, if you don't scale it, you don't get that effect. Uh, no, actually, this is only for the for the proximity communication. So the whole um, so this chip, the this big chip here, it com consumes based on the activity factor between five milliamp, five milliwatt to ten milliwatt. This is much this the whole thing is much more power consumption. What I was talking about is the communication energy between the two chips, not including, because this chip actually has many different things in it. Uh, hold on. This chip, basically, it has two links for, it has power management, which has the rectifiers, DC, DC converters. It receives data. It has one of the things that we have done in previous designs, for instance, people use crystal oscillators. We have on-chip PLL. We use this, the data, the power for uh, power telemetry is at 10 megahertz. We use the same signal as a reference clock for an on-chip PLL to generate uh, the required uh, voltage uh, clock signals for a 20 megabit per second data link. So these are all included in that up to 10 milliwatt of power consumption. But, but what I was reporting, maybe it was too fast, was that if we break down this chip now to smaller chips to be able to uh, put it in the eye with a very small incision, then these chips need to pro have proximity communication. And that's the cost of energy per bit that you need to spend to communicate between those chips and it's less than 0.2 picojoule per bit for the complete transceiver. Right. So you get, uh, you send a 10 megahertz signal here. This is very, like, uh, again, I'm not, uh, I didn't show you. There are a lot of work into how to build this link here. Yes, this is near field magnetic with a buffer coil that increases the efficiency significantly. So there is a buffer coil that you can put it like a contact lens in between because this is a very bad link. And then you have a full wave rectifiers and regulate DC-DC converter to generate higher voltages because the stimulation, while the dig everything digital is done at VDD, the stimulation is done at plus 2 VDD and minus 2 VDD. The reason is that the electrodes are relatively high impedance uh, electrodes because they are very small. They show high impedance with the tissue interface. Therefore, when you drive it with certain amount of current, you deliver current to the, to the tissue. And then afterwards, you extract the same amount of charge back. So that's another big challenge considering process variation. 
So we, do, we need the 2VDD because of high impedance of the electrode tissue interface. And um, so we also have, so this one of the main aspects of this chip is that it has a self-healing mechanism to balance the charge that deli is delivered to the tissue with the charge that is extracted to, from the tissue because we cannot accumulate charge in the tissue. There are, there are limitations on that. Uh, otherwise you damage the tissue. So there are some self-calibration going on. There are a lot of details here um, that uh, you can, actually we, there is a journal paper coming up and there is this ISSC paper that you can uh, check, it's from last year. It has more details. Um, and ob that's a good question. So basically, if you have, so, so for on-chip interconnect, that, that's, a, that's a actually a very relative, relevant question. So to maybe um, sacrifice the cross-section but send lower data rates, is that what you're asking? So you can basically use thinner wires and send lower data rates on them, or you can use wider wires and send a higher data rate on them. Is that your question? And then you can find an optimum. There has been some work related to that. If, is, is that your question? Data rate, optimum data rate for a given, yes, that's, so basically you can calculate that for the type of channel that you have. If you find a metric for the level of equalization that you need, as you increase the data rate, you need more equalization. And then um, you can basically, it's it very much channel dependent. So, so most of the time, as you increase the data rate, because you need to do equalization, you end up having higher uh, picojoule per bit, higher energy per bit. But in a lot of applications, you need to do that. But in a certain application that you have a limited area, then that's a relevant question, that how to, come, how to trade off between the width of your wire, for instance, or how much data you are sending to target a total aggregate data rate. So then for that, you can, you can calculate it. And that, that has been published, yes, but not by another group. Thank you very much.